Group Growing Legacies Thanks for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. We are in conversation today with Sanjeev Sanyal, Principal Economic Advisor to the Government of India, hoping to get his thoughts on the state of the Indian economy and some of the issues uh, that we need to tackle. Sanjeev, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Uh, Sanjeev, let me start by... Uh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me start by asking you for you know a wide view uh, as you see the Indian economy. Uh, you know we heard from the uh, from the MPC this week. They seem to believe that the output gap in the economy is closing. Uh, there are upside risks to inflation, and hence uh, you know uh, higher interest rates are justified. Uh, do you see the growth inflation mix in a similar fashion, Sanjeev? Well. Um I'm not going to comment on their monetary policy. That's their prerogative. Nevertheless, <clears throat> as far as their outlook for growth and inflation is concerned, um, basically what uh, the Reserve Bank is saying, and it, it's uh, broadly what others, including the IMF, are saying, is that the growth momentum is strong, and we should expect growth in somewhere in the 7.3 to 7.5 percent range uh, over the next several quarters into, in fact, the first quarter of the next financial year. So. Over the next one year or so, we should expect growth uh, to be pretty high, um, almost at 7.5%. Um, now, as a result of that, of course, the output gap uh, would begin to close. Um, that should perhaps not be surprising in some ways. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, note that they have uh, come up with an inflation forecast, uh, which suggests that uh, inflation has broadly peaked. As you know, inflation is running at about 5% for CPI on a year-on-year -year basis. And uh, the forecast that they have put together is that for the, re uh, for the second half of this uh, financial year, they expected at about 4.8%, which is slightly below where it is now. So what they are saying is that inflation has peaked and it will be moderately lower from where it is now and well within what is comfortable for their target range. So basically what you get is very robust growth and uh, controlled inflation. And in both cases, uh, the Reserve Bank is saying that uh, the balance of risk is even, so it's, uh, it's not that it is, uh, you know, the balance of risk is particularly strong in either direction. So I think uh, that's a reasonably fair assessment, um, uh, which, as I said, uh, fits with many other assessments that we also receive. So broadly, what I would argue is that uh, it's, a, it's a pretty robust um, outlook. I mean, inflation is controlled and very strong growth. Uh, in fact, not just strong growth. Uh, the fastest growing major economy in the world. Sure. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, you know, on growth, though, I know the numbers are looking good and uh, absolutely no taking away from the numbers. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, we've discussed the skew uh, for a while now, for years now, uh, the lack of private investment, the over-reliance on government spending. Uh, do you see that going away? Uh, the capacity utilization numbers are looking healthier at about 75%. Uh, but, you know, I, do, I don't know if that's the level where we start, start to see so-called animal spirits come back into private enterprise. Um, well, um, if capacity utilization is good and you are telling me output gap is closing, then uh, it's reasonable to expect that investment will come back uh, reasonably strongly. You're also getting credit accelerating uh, and gathering pace. Uh, FDI numbers have been good, so no particular reason why private investment shouldn't uh, pick up. That is precisely the kind of environment in which you should expect uh, growth uh, to pick up. So you can't complain that the output gap is closing and then say, oh my God, but private investment is not coming back. I mean, you, one or the other has to be true, no? Well, that is true, except for the balance sheet problem, you know, which has been sort of the, that, what, that has kept a cap on the private uh, enterprise segment. Which I, I mean, that, that is a constraint, right? Well, if, if, if capacity utilization is so good, then clearly the balance sheet problem is also getting unwound, by definition. Uh, well, well, maybe, uh, maybe not. Maybe the, maybe the companies that have uh, sort of been at the forefront of investments, Sanjeev, have not managed to deleverage. But I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I, I did, before of that, want to get your sense on whether, given this you know, domestic growth inflation balance that we just talked about, uh, the external sector... Uh, is perhaps what we need to worry about most, you know, the trade wars, uh, perhaps some far worrying that that could uh, transfer into currency wars as well. Uh, do you see that as the biggest risk? 
Well, there are certainly uh, uh, issues on the external front that we need to watch. I mean, trade wars, I mean, we are not ourselves the primary uh, cause of uh, international trade wars, but nevertheless, uh, it will have some impact on us and we need to watch what, how this evolves. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, it is an evolving situation, so really it's, uh, it's about how quickly we can respond to it. And incidentally, there may be even be opportunities coming out of the new environment that comes through, so don't entirely take it as negatively. But yes, it does require us to pay attention very closely to what's going on. Uh, the other thing is, of course, oil prices, which again is something that spiked quite high. It's come off a little bit, but it's still at elevated levels. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, you know, one of the concerns, uh, uh, well, you know, one of the uh, sort of uh, worries that some people have uh, talked about is uh, the government finances again. Uh, I know it's early in the year to say whether the fiscal deficit target is, um, you know, is going to be achieved or not, uh, but there was another round of GST cuts. People have said that the GST monthly collections have not kept pace with what they thought they would be. Uh, how do you see the state of government finances right now, Sanjeev? I think we are very comfortable. Uh, uh, GST collections have been uh, reasonably good. In fact, um, it has given, I mean, we have been able to begin to lower some of the uh, rates because we are comfortable with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have uh, cut the rates, would we? Um, similarly, you know, direct tax collections have been decent. Uh, and uh, with the cash flow that's coming through from it, we are even able to do other things. For example, give, um, uh, you know, the uh, tax refunds and other things that we ha usually take months and months to the end of the year, uh, we have been able to pretty much do 99% of that in the first quarter. So, um, you know, the cash flow situation is good. In fact, uh, as uh, it's not just with the central government, even the state governments you may have noticed uh, haven't been sort of rushing through with their borrowing program, uh, which suggests that everybody is comfortable with their cash situation and tax collections are doing reasonably well. There was some worry that there was a short-term cash flow mismatch, uh, you know, uh, ways and means, advances limit was increased, there were uh, borrowings from cash management bills. Uh, it, what was that about, Sanjeev? Is it just about the budget coming ahead and hence spending coming up front? Is that, was that the reason? No, no, we are doing, see, some of the things, that, like, for example, tax refunds that take to so the end of the year. We, we have sped that up. So this, you know, the system has you know, cash flow of the system is improved, uh, and other things. I don't think there's any particular major fiscal slippage that has happened. In fact, if you look at the last several years, the government has been quite tight on the fiscal front. So I don't think there's any, any sp anywhere where you know we are uh, being irresponsible in any way about the fiscal side. We'll be able to uh, meet the divestment targets, and if the big ticket item was Air India, which uh, you know for one reason or another is not going to happen uh, and the divestment target this year is fairly high. Don't yet write off the possibility of uh, Air India uh, disinvestment in this financial year. So, um, you know, the year is still early and uh, many things can happen along the way. Uh, and by the way, other divestments will also happen. Uh, there are various ways of doing it. We may sell off companies, we may create another uh, ETF uh, and uh, do disinvestment. So there are many uh, platforms that can be used for doing this. All right. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, you know, uh, Arvind Subramaniam, uh, the former CEA, uh, in his, one of his last interviews to us, had talked about, uh, you know, perhaps uh, repitching his idea that some capital could be released from the Reserve Bank of India's balance sheets uh, used to maybe recapitalize bank, uh, banks. Uh, is that something that you uh, are also pushing or are in favor of? Is that something the government is considering? Certainly, this has been debated for quite some time. And, uh, um, you know, I, I have some sympathy with uh, some of the things that uh, Arvind was saying. But, uh, you know, this debate has gone on and some certain views have been taken. And uh, this is really not for me, but for the Secretary economic affairs to make public what is the approach that will be taken. So I, I will not speak much on this. Okay. Uh, let me then move uh, to what seems like, uh, you know, I guess, uh, apart from the external front, the biggest bugbear domestically, and that continues to be the banking system, Sanjeev. Uh, what do you make of the recent attempts of banks to come together with yet another resolution framework? This time it's called Shashakt. Uh, I have to be honest, we're not entirely sure what the purpose of that one is.
See, basically what is being done, um, we are using the insolvency and bankruptcy code to um, liquefy many of these, uh, and even as we have forced uh, recognition of these stressed assets. So over time what has happened, what used to be stressed assets, getting stressed but not becoming quite NPAs, not getting provided against. So all of that we forced over the last year and a half to recognition then uh, uh, and, uh, and provision. And now we are trying to resolve some of it through the IBC process. So obviously the very largest cases were identified, first the 12 and then the 28 and then perhaps a bit more. And the idea here is that these cases will go through. Now obviously every single case um, now uh, cannot be processed at the same speed. So we have now created for particularly smaller schemes, you know, for uh, up to 50 uh, crores. We are hoping that this will, the, the bank the, the itself will be able to deal with. Then between 50 to 500, uh, the lead bank will take it and uh, try some sort of a resolution. The point is we don't want every single case right up front ending, ending up in the NCLT. So various since there is a time given in the IBC process, by the way, this is not an attempt to go outside the IBC process. We are still in the IBC process. That is still the framework. But in that framework, you do have this time, uh, you know, 180 days plus 90 days, 270 days and all. So what happens during that? So these are mechanisms created in order to take care of that. You also have AMCs being created and added to the ecosystem of investors and so on. So this is an evolving ecosystem, by, by the way, uh, it doesn't only, I mean, we are not the first people to invent this. Uh, if you go to the rest of the world, UK or the US, there's a whole ecosystem of people, professionals who do insolvency and bankruptcy. There are vulture funds of various kinds. There are AMCs of various kinds uh, who specialize in working in this field. Um, obviously, the uh, processes, etc. So all of that ecosystem is being put in place. But all of this remains, uh, through all of this, it remains the case that the insolvency and bankruptcy system remains the overall framework in which all of this is being done. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, you know, that was the problem because uh, this AMC, ARC or whatever that uh, gets created. Firstly, there are private ARCs which could play this ro uh, role should the pricing be right. Uh, but it did seem like they, uh, the banks are trying to avoid sending cases to the N uh, NCLT, uh, which then made us wonder why, because the IBC was supposed to be the biggest reform uh, that the banking sector got. Why are we now trying to avoid the IBC as a resolution pathway? Uh, no, I, I think you are completely. I think you are completely misunderstanding what I am trying to say. The IBC is the process, but the upstream of the IBC doesn't mean that everything. Any time you have a stress, you send it directly to liquidation, right? We have a process that has always been there. That before we do that, we have some resolution, and even when you put it into the process, even after that, you have time. So during that time, what happens? You have to have some mechanisms of resolution, right? We used to have a whole bunch of them called JLF and, uh, and so on, various other acronyms. But now, since we removed them, we now have a new bunch, which allow, by the way, an ecosystem of AMCs. By the way, uh, be clear that these, this, this is not AM, AMC, there's an ecosystem of AMCs. We are not trying to create a bad bank here at all. This is an ecosystem of different instruments that, the, by the way, the banks themselves are creating in most cases. They have just signed a... Um, uh, accord amongst themselves, and uh, for uh, and you know various mechanisms are being created, uh, so that there is an ecosystem of resolution. Um, but you know the ultimate uh, system remains the IBC. So remember, we are not in any way trying to replace the IBC. The IBC is the ultimate sort of framework. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, is the power sector the uh, sort of the biggest point of concern? Uh, do you still think uh, you need slightly longer time frames for resolution on power on the power sector assets? Because, you know, I think that's where everybody comes around and gets stuck. No, no, there has been a debate about it. And I think there's an Allahabad the High Court has also has a directive on this matter. So it will it is being looked at. Uh, but in the end, um, the broad framework of the IBC will remain in place. Um, so we will continue by that. I mean, we are not going to create exceptional systems for every single sector. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, what was the need for the LIC IDBI deal? Uh, I want to understand the government's thinking on this. I mean, uh, you know, essentially the burden of a very large or a reasonably large stress bank being passed on from the government directly 
to a quasi-government agency? I think this is again, uh, as I think uh, Acting Finance Minister Piyush Goel mentioned, this is a commercial deal. I mean, the LIC needed to ha have a banking outlet. It got one at a good price. Uh, LIC has a long record of buying uh, public sector assets, which it then uh, has been able to actually make a good uh, profits from. And in any case, uh, this is a commercial decision they have made. If they should feel that at some future date they want to change their opinion, the, their board can take that decision. So this was a decision of both the LIC board and the IDBI board. It works both ways. One of them provides capital, the other provides a branch network. It works well. But you don't see interconnectedness risks emerge from LIC. I mean, it is already by far in the too large to fail category. It has holdings in a number of public sector, some private sector banks. Uh, it has its own debt portfolio. Uh, aren't the interconnectedness risks quite substantial? No, it is a very, it is largest financial sector uh, institution by some margin. So interconnectedness is because it's so large, it's interconnected to everything, including the government, by the way. It is also the largest buyer of government bonds. So, uh, uh, so in that sense, given its size, it's connected to the whole system. Now the question is, did it make a com decision that is commercially non-viable? My contention is that it is not obvious, as many commentators make it to be, that this is sort of a fobbing off of a, of a bad asset to LIC. That is not at all the case. There is a commercial reason for doing it. They considered it and they took the, took the plunge. Um, it's their board has decided it. And, uh, you know, our view is that it's very likely that uh, LIC will actually find this an extremely profitable um, investment in the long run. Uh, the the capital position now that IDBI is out, I guess that saves a little bit uh, of uh, the capital for other banks, Sanjeev. But as things stand, uh, you're you're comfortable with you know meeting capital needs under the 2.11 lakh crore uh, program. See, uh, <clears throat> we haven't yet given out the full 2.11, so um, you know there's some more money that can be handed out on that original estimate. Uh, remember, meanwhile, that uh, many of these NPAs have already been written down completely and provided for. So now what is happening is that we are beginning to see fairly su substantial chunks coming back from the liquidation sale, etc., of these uh, NPAs. The first 12 cases alone, you've seen several of them getting done, some very chunky ones, and some more chunky ones coming through probably quite soon. In addition to which, you've also seen um, because uh, of the change in the sort of credit culture, uh, fairly large amounts of money also coming back with promoters coming back and repaying uh, the banks. I mean, estimates are floating around, but they're in the 80 to 90,000 crore range where uh, other than uh, these top companies, uh, others have also come back and repaid. Uh, so, you know, whether it's the top 12 companies where I think more than one lakh crores of uh, just from these 12 companies are likely to be recovered, maybe somewhere in the, you know, 1.2 lakh, 1.3 lakh, somewhere in that range. Plus, already you've got uh, this 80, 90 lakhs coming through somewhere in that range. And then there are, there's a pipeline of other companies. So you're going to get a very substantial amounts of recoveries coming through, which are going to directly go back to the banks. And they have this is, they have recovered, uh, I mean, they've already provided for it. So, you know, this is uh, pretty good. Okay. Sanjeev, a slightly different issue. Just but important to thing to remember is that we do want the banks to, we also want the banks to grow again. So it's one thing to simply provide, you know, regulatory capital to them. Ultimately, because the economy is growing, you, you're, we just discussed a little earlier about the need uh, 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 for um, a private investment coming back because output gap, et cetera, is closing. We do recognize that the uh, industrial sector, particularly MSMEs, need bank capital. So uh, we do need to get the, these banks up and running and expanding again. So I don't think, uh, so we do recognize that it's not just a matter of providing them with the regulatory capital, they need growth capital as well. So should they need it, uh, a provision and effort will be made to provide it. But right now, I think we are still within that original 2.11 lakh crore space so we can go further on that. Um, there's money coming back from recovery. So for the time being, uh, we are comfortable with it. 
but if necessary we will make other arrangements as well Sanjeev, I have two last questions. Uh, one is, uh, why has the government stepped back on the FRDI bill? Uh, uh, was it, uh, you know, uh, was it the concerns around the bail-in provision, uh, or are there other concerns that have been raised as well? Several concerns were raised by experts and uh, by public at large during consultations. They will be, we will look at them, and we will revisit the whole matter at some point. Was it largely the bail-in provision or was there, uh, as the Business Standard reports today, some reluctance on the part of the Reserve Bank of India as well? No, no, the, we, as I said, we got a lot of feedback. We have got a lot of feedback, so we will take that feedback and, uh, you know, uh, act accordingly. Okay, so it doesn't go forward in the current form anymore. Possibly not, yes. We'll have to look at, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm not the person dealing with it, so I can't comment. Uh, Sanjeev, let me just get back to the broader economy and, you know, ask you, I've thrown a lot of questions your way, uh, but what do you see as, uh, you know, things that the government needs to prioritize on, uh, whether it's agriculture, the rural economy, uh, or anything else? Uh, where, where do you think the priorities need to lie over the next uh, 12 odd months? Well, on agriculture, for example, uh, we have, so far at least, the, uh, the monsoon rains have been decent. Um, and uh, if uh, this continues, we should get a reasonably good crop this year. Uh, we have obviously already announced the MSB hikes, so um, we should get both quantity and price should be good. So that should feed through to the rural economy uh, uh, well. Um, as far as the industrial economy is concerned, we have some reason to believe it's gathering pace. Um, you have seen recent numbers; they have more or less been, you know, uh, positive uh, and accelerating. So. Um, and this is true also of car sales, truck sales, etc. Although the July number is likely to be down because the year-on-year -year comparison will be because of the GST uh, spike last year. But nevertheless, generally speaking, sales of automobiles or um, consumer goods have been gathering pace. Now that we have cut GST, we may get some fill-up from that as well. Uh, and the services sector had anyway been growing quite, uh, quite strongly for quite some time, whether it's airlines or tourism or, and so on. Uh, and after a fairly long gap, the banking sector has also begun to lend. Uh, a, the recent numbers suggest that uh, you're seeing uh, credit growth in, uh, well into double digits now. So, so the financial sector is also growing. Um, so, you know, it looks reasonably good. I mean, the, the growth rate, real growth rate of 7.5%, um, uh, or thereabouts uh, is well within what uh, we should expect and as I said that remains the fastest growing major economy in the world. What about trade Sanjeev? You didn't mention uh, trade. People are still worried about the core export import balance, uh, whether we've become uh, you know, uncompetitive due to uh, currency movements over, uh, over uh, valuation perhaps of the currency uh, and imports of items like you know, telecom equipment etc which are making a serious sort of you know, numerical impact on our trade balance. So we watched the trade balance quite uh, carefully, um, and as we had discussed earlier, there will be dis this potential disruption because of uh, trade wars and so on can happen. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as I said, um, the current account has not, although it may have uh, widened because of oil and other reasons, it hasn't gone to a level where it is worrying. We are very comfortable as far as our foreign exchange reserves are concerned, and uh, even uh, exports are accelerating. So. Um, you know, there is no particular reason to, to get too concerned at this stage. You don't worry about the currency uh, being overvalued, and uh, uh, although I'm not sure what one can do about that. Well, um, uh, our exchange rate policy or, uh, has been consistent, and the Reserve Bank, as you know, manages it uh, uh, on a consistent basis for a long time, basically based on allowing the rupee in the medium term to find its own level. Um, in the short run, of course, it has, uh, it, uh, you know, manages volatility uh, and for that it has the, uh, for enough foreign exchange reserves to um, deal with it in either direction. So I think uh, uh, Reserve Bank should uh, uh, continue to manage it the way it has done now for quite some time. So by and large, we will continue to allow the rupee to find its own level. All right, Sanjeev, pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much uh, for your patience taking all of our questions on the economy and on banking. Uh, that's Sanjeev Sanyal, our principal economic advisor to the government of India, speaking to us on Bloomberg Quinn. Thanks for watching.